Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor, Thomas Goss, bringing you the 84th and actually 152nd and final score uh, of this 2022 orchestration challenge covering the Prelude in G by Vasil Barvinsky. And what a journey it has been. Uh, I have looked at everything from little chamber arrangements and string orchestras and wind band and, uh, you know, and a beautiful full orchestra. And now we have this, this sort of orchestra plus, uh, plus guest instruments. And what's cool about this score, you know, it's, it's the, the standard 10 bar epil or excuse me, epilogue prologue to the Prelude uh, by Dan, which, Dan, this is a really fun score. Um, yeah. So it has a few unfamiliar instruments, and uh, I think that, I think that, like, the least you could do, Dan, <laughs> is supply some alternates. Like, for instance, so for Sopilka, like not a lot of people might be might have access to that, right? So, so maybe scoring like like or like saying or like soprano recorder, right? Would um would cover these this same little solo, right? For instance, um, and then here you've got glass harmonica or bowed vibraphone. See, like here you provided a substitute, which is great, and then of course vibes, like you know. Yeah, I mean, it'd be so easy for the player to just, like, finish this, then pick up their mallet and go plink, plink, plink. And then you've got theremin, which is not so obvious, but, you know, I I believe in you, Dan. I think you can come up with an alternate, you know, whether it's, like, just maybe English horn or, um, you know, maybe, maybe like... Um, like alto clarinet or or basset horn or something like that would be the perfect substitute instrument uh, to sort of give it that kind of fluty, fruity kind of a sound. All right, well, just, you know, just looking at everything, like looking at all the solos and so on, you know, it's it's fine. It's Basically, it's a piece for Sopilka. And then right after that, you've got theremin with a little bit of Sopilka returning, and then, and then that's the end of the piece. All right, so like... <clears throat> So it's just a matter of like saying like like everything aside and assuming these instruments all sort of work in the way that they're supposed to. Um, uh, let's just kind of analyze the score for what it is. Okay, so <clears throat> first thing, <clears throat> we really should have had some kind of um, of tempo marking at the beginning, right? So that's like that you got to tell your players how fast things are right so on Dante Sostenuto and then there's like a there's the marking of a quarter note equals 88 and so on <clears throat> so that has to go at the beginning and then here you mark a cello rondo in a few different parts and really the a cello rondo should be what's called system text so like the same as the the tempo marks right so so the cello rondo would go up here not in the individual parts of the musician so sometimes like in piano music you'll see ritardando and a cello rondo right there in the expression text especially if the if the um change of tempo is perceived to be an extension of the expression of the piece right <clears throat> however the appropriate place for it in most concert music and and written music today would be above. So system text rather than staff text, okay? Or expression text. Like, <clears throat> and then the same thing here, you say poco ritardando in a couple of parts. So that would happen after the moderato, right? Um, so like maybe like moderato and then putting in this really long thing, you could just say meno, right? And then, um, and then you could say poco ritardando after that, just to save some space. So meno meaning like not so much. Okay, so that so that's one thing to think about. Okay, then let's think about some other scoring things. You don't really need system text 
all over the place. I would say uh, put some, in a score like this, put some over the top instrument and then put some over the violins, right? And unless you, like, I mean, if you had massive, massive scoring, you know, like here you have about, let's see, just to count them up, 12, 16, 20, 23 staves, right? But if you had like a score with like maybe 30 or 40 staves on it, then you might want to put the tempo marks above, say, the, the brass or something. But but you really only need system text over the violins and over the top. And sometimes, sometimes like certain publishers prefer to put the system text at the top and at the bottom, right? That you see that I think that's in um, Holst's Planet. I might be wrong about that. In fact, I actually have the score right here, so I could just take a look at it. And uh, yeah, that's what they do. Now, see, my memory did not play tricks with me. But, you know, put it over the violins and over the first violin part. All right, now, um, <clears throat> uh, while we're on the topic of solo instruments, I would put all of these special guests to the orchestra in between the uh, percussion and the strings, right? So, so Pilka, Theremin, I would, you know, I'd put them down here. Because um, it's like it is a solo instrument, right? And and that's really the whole focus is really on this folk instrument playing. There's a there's a pretty cool video if if anybody wants to look up the Sopilka. It's um it's like talks about this one guy who makes the instruments and kind of goes around from school to school in Ukraine, I, I believe it is, and um, sort of hands them around to students and <clears throat> gets them to learn to play them and so on. But you know, essentially, it's it's a it's a recorder, right? It's a it's like the similar to the baroque recorder, kind of um, you know, like um, <clears throat> it's a flute with a uh, with a straight mouthpiece, um, like you know, going directly into the end, just like a recorder, and uh, you know, it has a very similar sound. All right. <clears throat> So I would put the Sopilka and the Theremin right, right under the vibes. Okay, now let's talk about the efficacy of the scoring. Um, <clears throat> you come in here with like, uh, uh, like Forte Sopilka, right? And I think you don't need to be so darn loud with your soloists, right? I mean, what is the what is the overall vibe? What is the overall feeling here at the beginning of the piece? It is um, it is like a, a feeling of reverie, really, kind of like it's almost like what people feel when they wake up, right? It, it has that kind of um, collecting one's thoughts and getting ready to feel and experience something, you know, almost like you know the stillness in the morning, right? So I think your sopilka could just be piano espressivo, right? And you can add nuances, you know, like da 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 da, then diminuendo da da, and then a further crescendo da 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 da. da. And you don't have to crescendo all the way up to forte either. It could just be like mezzo forte or mezzo piano, and then diminuendo to to piano again. Now, uh, starting out just completely solo, that's really gorgeous. Uh, I, I would take a little bit of issue with your slurring here. I, I think that like what is much more natural to a folk player would be long note, tongue, this next one, slur, and then tongue, right? So, ta, ta, ta. And then this is all great, ta ta, and this is fine, ta 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 ta. Maybe a slur here, ta. Now, um, a clarinet and um, glass harmonica or bowed, bowed vibraphone. I would make it the same length as the clarinet part. And you, you know, like, you might be thinking, well, you know, I need to make it. I need to mark it forte in order for it to balance with the uh, the clarinet. So that that might be true in the um, in the sound set that you've got, 
But in real life, I would say piano espressivo on your sopilka, and then uh, clarinet and um, glass harmonica, uh, the same dynamic. I would say I would mark them both pianissimo, or maybe at the loudest, the glass harmonica um, being um, perhaps piano. Now there's a further issue here, and that is that um, glass harmonica can, I think, uh, is it like each each hand can play up to three pitches at once or something. Uh, maybe, maybe even more. I, it's been a while since I looked into the uh, into the specifics of that. But for bowed vibraphone, you might need two players here, right? So like one, one each each holding a bow on a specific thing, because it's like it's, yeah. I mean, maybe somebody could build a harness, <laughs> a special harness to play thirds, um, with uh, with one hand, like or one, with one player, you know, holding both bows. But it's really, generally speaking, I, I, from what I understand, it's it's better to have one player each on each bow, All right? So you have to think about that. Okay. <clears throat> um, and yeah, and then then here, like you are, um, you're only having your glass harmonica play one of these pitches, not both. I'm I'm a little confused. Um, yeah. So I would keep this horn note here to a pianissimo, right? So piano espressivo, um, pianissimo is fine here. Piano or pianissimo, maybe piano. All right, just like we're talking about realistic dynamics. Piano on these. Um, on these instruments here, and then horn here, uh, pianissimo. Now here, if you take my advice and you push into this from you know like right in here, so this is the high point and the louder point. You may want um, to start off piano here and then crescendo into like say mezzo piano, mezzo forte, whatever, and then everybody diminuendo together, right? Uh, but except I, I respect what you're doing here. Um, uh, you know, da da ba da da da. So you sort of want an answer, right? A question and answer kind of a thing. So that's fine. So I would say in that case, this part right here could be piano crescendo to mezzo forte and so on, and then diminuendo. But I, but you know, like you don't don't overdo that, right? This is really cool. The little touch of uh, vibraphone in here, um, doubling the sopilka. So you know, I mean, that's it's a it's a strange sound. Um, I would say like that really kind of folk baroque kind of a sound, ma matching it with such a modern instrument. Uh, question about this vibraphone part here, and that is, is the motor on or off? Um, how long does the pedal go? Does it like sort of, does it combine everything in a wash or is the player pedaling out the different tones as they go? You should just mark all that in with your pedal. Uh, one thing I, I would say to watch out for is that, like clarinets, I, I believe that clarinet and oboe, even you know, like they can easily play louder than your, you know, than a than a standard baroque recorder, but they don't have that same pointiness of sound, right? So if you push your your folk flute player, uh, it, it can get to be a little painful. You know what I mean? It's I think it's better to just mark mark more idealized dynamics in a situation like this where you have a lot of special guests and then to leave it to the rehearsal to balance, right? And the player, right? They will kind of know. Uh, okay, so now now here you go into like the whole like theremin um, and and it's just like a question of like, what is, what does fortissimo mean? Um, you, you're you're setting yourself a really difficult problem here, and that is that horns have such an absorptive sound, and they you know they can really be penetrating. And and kind of forceful, but you know even at that, like I feel that you should have uh, revoiced these chords. So like if you want a triad here. I think you should have had your third and first on the same pitches, and then 
uh, this pitch would be played by the second just as you scored it, and this lower pitch by the fourth. But like once again, the third part <clears throat> would be the same as the first part, right? So just try to keep the weight on the top as you go with all of these chord voicings. And then, you know, bassoon and bass clarinet kind of going back and forth. Why doesn't the bass clarinet come in here? I don't understand. Why, why can't we have an even, um, like an even color all the way through? Maybe you're thinking, well, I'm just adding the bass clarinet because I want to add like more weight as we go and then push. Okay, maybe, but if you want to do that, then I would say start pianissimo and then crescendo to mezzo piano here. So just like, so we really kind of see that you're fading in. Or maybe do that from here, like um, <clears throat> have your bass clarinet fade into mezzo piano from a previous pitch, right? The previous written G here. Um, all right. Yeah. So do you, you know, like here you've set up, you've sort of established the slurring on this, uh, on this kind of dotted rhythm pattern here. Do you want that here? You know, ta 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 ta. Do you know what I mean? I mean, it just might might sound a whole lot smoother, especially playing against the theremin, which is smooth in its itself, right? Um, yeah. And here you've marked like fortissimo, right? And I, and I just like you're not going to get that out of the theremin. I think that it's better for the player to have a perception of what is the volume against the other, with, against the rest of the performers, right? So they might not feel that they can play a fortissimo. So it might be better to say like mezzo forte, right? I'd say mark this this mezzo forte, and then like with everything else that's going on, perhaps like piano in the other parts. So mezzo forte, piano in these parts. And if you want even a further balance, you could sort of do a little bit of pussyfooting in here and, and even mark your horns pianissimo, but I don't think you need to go to that extreme. I think piano in your company parts, uh, uh, mezzo forte in your theremin part, and like that, and then that's just like a situation where the player can sort of turn it up or turn it down. So like, look, one of the problems here, Dan, is if you, um, if you are just starting loud or or extra loud on a solo like this then you know compared to the fabric of the other parts you've got like nowhere to go right so i i think that like like just thinking of the whole scope of the dynamics here let's say you started off piano espressivo crescendo here all the way up to say mezzo forte or forte or mezzo forte and then diminuendo back and then i think that gives you permission to mark this mezzo forte right I mean, especially as it's such an eerie sound. Um, and I, aren't there like settings for the theremin, like uh, how much vibrato to use? And, uh, you know, so, so you should learn those and put them in your score if you're really serious about this. I mean, you might have just done this for fun. So, but I mean, if you were serious about it, just think about those other things. Um, yeah, so here you can go, like when you have a bar like this, you can have like a half note on beat four. Right, half rest. Excuse me, half rest on beat on beat four. Right, and then followed by a rest. I mean, there there are a few different ways of, but anyways, I guess that's just up to your. Some people would also put like have no problem with a dotted half note too, right? Like you've got here, rather than like three, like or five quarter rests in a row. Right, it gets to be a little hard to read. Um, <clears throat> all right, and. Crescendo to forte piano here. That's fine. It does leave you kind of a cliff that you're falling off of. And here you're going tremolo into this. Yeah. So let's say that everybody is piano, right? And then you're crescendoing in here to mezzo forte. Like if everybody's going to forte, then the string should go to forte, right? The strings are the are like the weakest section in the orchestra. Why are they being scored under everybody else? Nobody's going to hear them. Uh, and here, you absolutely never will ever have to do this ever. <laughs> you know, the players know that this is a down bow, and they know that that's an up bow. Okay.
they got it, you know, especially up bow on a crescendo, right? They, they know their stuff. They don't need any help from us on that. Yeah, so um, I think if you really want this to be pianissimo at the ending, like then just really make it a pianissimo um, in all the parts. But I actually guess that, you know, I think it would be better to go pianissimo crescendo to forte, and then, uh, and then if this is forte piano, so these are piano, right? So this should absolutely be at least piano. Because otherwise, all you hear are the horns, right? And then, like, these winds continue on. You still can't hear the strings. Then here you have piano in your lower heavy brass. And, I mean, how are we going to hear these violas and and double basses? And why no cello, right? Why can't the cello be doubling? You've got, you've got two trombone players here playing this E, right? So you don't need any cello in here? Maybe it just dropped out. When you were scoring it so yeah so i just think you completely need to rethink the balance here and how everything else is working and you know it just could be that like your balance is really all off here because your sound set is so weird you know you might have really really loud like bass clarinet and contrabassoon sounds and and kind of kind of softer uh lower heavy brass right and it's sometimes that just has to do with how, how well it's designed if they spend more time with a particular instrument family um they might actually have and, and you've heard this i mean i'm sure that you guys have heard this in different sound sets like the the strings will be decent uh but the brass will be really tinny and silly and like the um, some of the winds will have a beautiful sound, like the flute might sound great, and the um, the clarinet might sound great, but the oboe and the bassoon are just horrible. Or it's the other way around. The oboe and the bassoon sound great, but the clarinet sounds really tinny and 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 you know just sounds like a like a DX7 from back in the early 80s. So yeah, so I'm guessing that there is some there there may be some issues here with out of balance sounds, and I'm I'm not sure what. Uh, application this is uh, if it's finale or dorico then um, then you can I think you can use note performer which in which everything really is a lot more balanced not perfectly but but pretty close and if it's um, if it's muse score I think like there's an upgrade that some of their sounds are supposed to be better now I, I don't know um, but you know like I, I usually I used to not worry about sound sets at all um, and that was, uh, when I was, you know, I mean, I was still like, okay, so my career started to take off 22 years ago, 23 to tw 22 to 23 years ago. And I, I still made mock-ups back then, but I kind of like did them, uh, usually for working with, with dance companies, right. Or, or like multimedia or something like that. So occasionally I would do a mock-up for somebody's recording session and then they would like then they would add like live instruments over it until there was no more mock-up left right things like that and I usually do that with like da what the whatever version of a daw there was back then oftentimes I would just use like the sequencer on my my keyboard like I I worked a lot with Insonic keyboards back then, and they, you know, their their sequencing system, as primitive as it may seem today, was actually pretty advanced for back then. Um, and then I started using other, you know, more software-based things and so on. But uh, but yeah, so I didn't really like with that on one side, and then working with live orchestras on the other, like constantly um, up to today. I just really didn't worry that much about mock-ups, but I just found a trend over the past dozen years, um, just how useful a decent mock-up was from a notation application. So I'm, I, you know, I do think that there is something to it. There, there's something that we should really. It's a factor that we should, we should think about, right? Um, it and it's not, it's not trying to make our our music sound good so the mock-up sounds good, but definitely taking into into account that. Who our client or or collaborator or whatever is going to need a more or less realistic um, idea of how the orchestra is going to sound before we hire an orchestra. Anyway, so 
that's my those are my thoughts all right so here we have uh sopilka coming back one more time and you know i you know the thing is like there's a bit of a disconnect you know you know it just like seems like it really is like the distance between these two in terms of their pitch is a bit abrupt right i'm just wondering like if the theremin couldn't be an octave higher here uh, and then you have this sort of dramatic push right in here, which once again, I feel everybody should be at least be equal in weight. Um, yeah, so I think that this can be piano, and I think that you could even crescendo in from a piano rather than pianissimo. Pianissimo is fine, though. Um, I don't, I don't, yeah, and then you know, some things are, are, are tremolo and some aren't, but all right, that doesn't matter. What matters is reach here and everybody should be forte, <clears throat> not just your brass. I think if you're just going to push forward, like you might as well just put an accent here so that everybody has the same accent, right? I wouldn't put a, I wouldn't bother too much with a forte piano here on just a quarter note unless you are going to maintain, like unless you, the the sound is going to keep going, right? So uh, everybody crescendo to a forte accent and then piano marking right here, okay? And as far as that goes, if like this is piano and this is piano, not pianissimo, then I think you have you know, pretty good shot here. It's, you know who I'd make pianissimo? I'd make all this piano, and I'd add the cello, and I'd make the lower heavy brass pianissimo. And I would keep these elements piano, right? And, and like, if you're going to slur here, then this should slur, right? So, yeah, so just, like, so that they're playing out a little bit more. Mezzo forte is too too strong. All right, and then, then, then you can have your diminuendo. So, so I'd say, like, both parts piano diminuendo here at the end leading to um i'd say these interests to piano diminuendo and then everybody maybe diminuendo down to uh, pianissimo and then i think what you've got here has got a shot of sounding good so so i i know you kind of did this sort of almost as like a last minute sort of fun kind of project you know not a joke i mean obviously you like you know you want to know whether you want me to take this seriously and not just laugh it off and and i am taking it seriously and i don't think that it is like funny in the way of you know haha this is just a joke not at all <clears throat> so you know so those are that that's my estimate of it so just to treat what your effort is you know seriously enough to where you get you pick up some some scoring tips, some some orchestration perspective, and so on. So look, um, you weren't able to do this until the last minute, and this was like one of the positively last scores I received. It certainly was the last score I received in Patreon, and I think that there was uh, there was either one just before, or just after that was a website subscriber entry. <clears throat> but I'm you know I'm thinking back on it, I'm pretty sure this was the very last entry of the um, of the entire challenge. So, like, give yourself more time next time, okay, Dan? Like, um, especially, like, next, the next, um, like, even if you just orchestrated the uh, introduction of the next uh, part, the next, excuse me, the next orchestration challenge, I think you would just get a huge amount out of it, and it would be great for you to particularly orchestrate this composer and say, hey, I orchestrated XYZ composer, check out my effort, right? Um, because it, it will be, you know, the composer will have enough cred to where, like, you you know, I'm actually anticipating a lot of people will jump on, and I may actually do a sort of an extended thing, like, um, really just to set all projects aside and just start evaluating people's scores as soon as I get them, because I don't see how else I am going to get through this. And let me tell you, I do not want to do this again. <laughs> um, you know, get into this huge crunch where I'm like, I'm, I'm evaluating three scores a day and just, just trying to get everything out of the way before the end of the year. I just, I think that's not fair to you. It's not, it certainly isn't the funnest thing for me. Although I'll tell you, it's like, here I'm saying it isn't the funnest thing for me, but I can't think of more fun that I've had recently than these last two weeks, just, just looking at one score after another. God, it's just, I mean, it's part of me. For a part of me, it's heaven. For the part of me that, you know, needs to go on vacation, <laughs> it's another story, right? But, you know, don't think I haven't been enjoying myself. It's just been just massive fun. So I need to sort of manage my time a little bit better next year. Um, and, you know, in get it to the point where you know, it's kind of dialing it back to when I had fewer entries and I was able to 
uh, sort people's uh, efforts and and feedback uh, pretty soon after they had uh, submitted their scores. Uh, but anyways, like the next the next challenge will definitely have something worth sinking your teeth into, even if it's like just the first twelve bars, right? The four I think it's is it a two bar or a four bar intro, and then uh, and then like an, an additional eight bars before things get a little complicated. So with that cryptic comment, I'm just going to say thank you, Dan, so much for like I mean. You know, obviously, like your support in this was more about, um, you know, about helping the channel and helping the appeal that we had um, for Ukrainian musicians, for which I will be grateful to you <laughs> and everybody else uh, for, you know, forever. Um, I'm not going to be able to do that every year, but I was so glad that I was able to do it this year. Uh, to, 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 you know, have an appeal or, or some other kind of thing. It's just so much to organize on top of everything else. But, you know, obviously it was more about that than about, like, turning in, like, a really massive, long, uh, very, very long entry. So I just really appreciate that gesture and, you know, that commitment and your presence in the community. You know, you've been such a great member and, like, commenting on people's things and giving them, you know, giving them feedback of your own, your thoughts, your... You know, and, and keeping things light and humorous and, and yet professional and all that other stuff. So I just really appreciate all that. It's just, you know, really means a lot. And, um, you know, and I, I, I'm so happy that, like, you were a part of this, you know, even if it's just for, you know, it's kind of a last minute fun uh, entry. Uh, still, you know, I hope I was able to give you some serious feedback to sort of thinking about more organized efforts that you're going to take on maybe next year's challenge. Um, you know, there's a part of me that just wants to like, in two months, just do start it again. You know, let's start the orchestration challenge in March. But you know, no, I need I need some time to um, to decompress from this one. Uh, so yeah, um, so thank you so much for all of that, and thanks to all of my other Patreon supporters out there, and for everybody being so patient with me as I tried to sort of, uh, keep my head above water with everything. You know, it wasn't just the orchestration challenge, uh, re the real problem was my actual career, <laughs> you know, as an orchestrator, and, and just certain ways that my time had to organize themselves around other people's speed, needs progress and other things and i'm not complaining and you know mad at them at all it's just like the realities of like their commitments you know people getting covid things getting canceled moved around people taking breaks um and having you know certain big things on the calendar and so on and so forth it's sort of you know looking forward at my at my schedule for you know the next year or two it's like how could i even like think that I could schedule anything, you know, um, after that. But I still have an optimistic streak in me, and I have some plans that I think everybody's really going to enjoy. Um, some stuff for everybody to study on the channel, some stuff for uh, Patreon supporters, some exclusive content that is going to work itself into a book, and then also plans for another orchestration tips book and so on. So it's just like, how much can I achieve? How much time will I get? How easy will it be? How much do I have to spend orchestrating this opera? You know, how complex will that get? How many rewrites? Stuff like that, you know. I mean, everybody knows who's, who's doing it. So I will just stop there with thanks to everybody and thanks to everyone who has made it through all of these uh, videos uh, and who have has listened to every minute of it including my kind of garbled uh, thank yous at the end of each one <laughs> uh, you guys are awesome I think this is the best community on the internet for for anything you know you guys are just so sincere and committed and you know, artistic and, um, you know, and, and you have a real joy in, in what you love and you bring that into the group. And I'm so appreciative of that. So thanks, everybody. Thank you, Dan. And uh, now I'm going to take a holiday and I will see you guys in about three weeks. All right. Love you all. <laughs>